God, we love you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the things that you've been doing in Acorn, in our lives, in our families. God, we pray for your healing spirit to sweep this room even now for those who have pains in different ways, emotional pains, spiritual pains, physical pains. And I pray, God, that you would make yourself real to us through the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. been a good week. It's been interesting. I've uh, seen a little victories here and there in different ways. And uh, in the spiritual realm, and I don't know if you think like this, but sometimes I feel like there's, there's an oppression, a spiritual cloud. And we're in and out of that kind of depending on what's going on. And it's not necessarily a reflection of our own uh, sinfulness. You can definitely be under a dark spiritual cloud because of your actions, but sometimes it's the oppression of your country or the things that are going on around you. Sometimes uh, it's, it's forces that you don't understand. There are stories in the Bible that kind of depict this at times. One of them that is kind of famous has to do with one of the prophets and kings and how the uh, enemy forces have gathered around him and his servant says, what are we going to do? Look at them. They, they, they outnumber us. They're all over the hills. And the prophet says to, his, to God, Lord, open his eyes so that he could see. And, and all of a sudden, he begins to see all the angelic forces all about and they far outnumber the enemy. And so when I talk about a spiritual cloud or forces, it's not necessarily... Um, like Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh with the cloud hanging over him and woe is me. It's, it's more that there's a real battle going on and sometimes we don't realize it. Sometimes uh, it's bigger and it's different. It's, 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 it's not just the struggle at work or the struggle at school or a test coming or, or sickness or, or pain. It's, it's something deeper, spiritual, eternal. It's... it's and, the, and this week's been interesting because I, I feel like parts of the spiritual battle are the, the sh like shingles, like the canopy that has kind of been over us for a little while. I feel like part of that canopy, the, the angelic forces of light have been stripping away a few shingles and, and some beams of light have been busted through. <laughs> and I'm grateful. Grateful. I've seen beams of light bust through for my father-in-law. Uh, I've seen it in my own life and some of the relationships I have. I've seen it with the Morrises. And I've seen it um, with some of your testimonies. But some of you are still in the shade. You're like, well, I want my beam of light, Lord. Peel down a shingle for me. And, and I'm pretty sure he's, he's uh, got his specific timing and plan for you. Stay under the canopy and the wings of the Almighty. Stay within the blessings and the comforts of your God. Serve Him with all your might. Pray to Him. Read His Word. Read His love letter to you and participate in the fellowship and seek that body of Christ because there's healing in it. It's where the blood flows. It's where life is given. And it's where you will find your comfort and your refuge and your rest. It's there waiting for you. You know, today I want to speak about a man who was the first martyr of the church. And, you know, when we think about comfort and rest and, 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 and the blessings of Christianity, I think in today's selfish, self-centered, kind of materialistic world, a lot of people that come to Christianity come to Christianity for what they perceive will be the benefits to their life now. They want their life now to be better, and that's why they're becoming Christians. And I can testify and tell you that my life is better because of becoming a Christian. My family structure's better. My future's better. Everything in my life changed for the better because of the choice to be a Christian. But it doesn't necessarily operate that way. Like as if I'm going to be a Christian because if I'm a Christian, my life will be better here on earth in this terrestrial world. And it's not really um, a good selling point. 
when you think about this guy Stephen, he gets killed for being a Christian. His life on earth is terminated. He's the first martyr of the church. And that doesn't sell well to a, a mindset that is, I just want to make my life better. You know, we go to college to make our lives better. We, we select jobs to make our lives better. We, we, we find the home of our dreams to make our life better. We choose a spouse to make our life better. We circle our friends with certain type of people to make our life better. Everything in we do in life, the, the, the choices where we live, the things that we eat, the diet that we have, the exercise that we have, we're always trying to make this life better. And, and that's cool for this life. But it may not do anything for your eternal life. You can invest and do all those things really well and make this life appear awesome to you and to those around you. And yet it's so temporal. It's just a moment in time. You are an eternal being. You may not even realize it. But you are going to live forever. And your day here is just one tiny reflection of that eternity. It's just a moment. It's just a fleck in time. It's just one feather on the bird. It's just, it's just one fleck of sand on the beach shore. And if you invest all your time and your efforts to make that one grain of sand on the beach shore shine, and you think everything about life is that one grain of sand, how foolish you are. How wasteful you are. And I'm not telling you to trash your life now. I want you to be blessed and reflecting the glory of God and Jesus in your life now. But to remember that it's for something longer and more grand than this. And so when troubles come, and you might even be martyred, it's not a loss for you. Because your investment isn't in the one grain of sand of time. It's just not the fleck of time. It's an eternal relationship with Jesus. And so Stephen, Stephen I don't think felt a moment of regret. And, and we won't get to it today because this is going to be a, a, a more than one part sermon. But in his final breaths, he's not hating on the people who stone him. In his final breaths, he's not feeling like life was stripped from him. In his final breath, he's not feeling resentment towards God or man because he's being murdered. His final breaths are, Lord, forgive them because they don't even know what they're doing. Lord, don't hold, he says, the sin against them. Who else said something like that? Wow. How do you get to a place of, of, of mentality like that. And who is this guy, Stephen? We just got introduced to him. He's a guy selected to wait tables on the Hellenistic Jewish women that are widows. He's a table waiter. And his name is Stephen, so he's probably... Hellenistic himself. What does that mean? It means you're a Jew from out there. You're not from the homeland. You're not from Jerusalem. You're not in the in crowd. You're from out there. And he's been selected among the seven to be a table waiter so that the apostles can focus on prayer and the reading of the word. And when they select those seven guys, it starts with, we need people, the apostle said, we need people full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And then when they select them, and, and, and the, the scriptures pause there in Acts chapter 6 and verse 5, and it says, when they select Stephen, they find him one to be full of faith and the Holy Spirit. 
And when we read our text today in verse 8, we'll see that it says he was full of grace and power. Do you need all that to be a servant? And how did he get himself in a position where he's been called to serve tables and to run the food bank, but now he's enemy number one, getting stoned by the elders, the council members, the Sanhedrin, the most well-respected Jewish men of the culture are picking up stones to crush his skull. How do you create that level of hatred from your own people? It's interesting. You know, the Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to the judging of your thoughts and your heart. There is something amazing about God's Word is that when it's purely preached, unadulterated, and delivered to you, it goes right down into your head and into your heart, and it judges you. It affects you. The Word of God, when it's delivered, delivered properly, has a ability not to return void. It's going to unravel you. It's going to have an effect. It's going to sometimes give you comfort. Sometimes the Word of God will give you peace or joy or direction or anger, frustration, conviction, guilt, shame, hatred even. The Word of God, if delivered correctly, will have an effect on you. And in this case, we're going to see that it had an effect. And the effect in this case was from people that didn't want to receive it. They stuffed their ears. They ground their teeth, the Bible says. They began to be so frustrated at what they were hearing. The only thing they could think of was murderous thoughts. All they wanted to do is stop the voice. Let me stop the voice. So we're in Acts chapter 6. And I'm going to start in verse 7. And I will read the whole text down to 15 and then we'll come back. So the word of the Lord, so the word of the God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. This is a kind of a new concept for the church, that priests are pouring into it. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Wow. So backing up to Acts chapter 6 in verse 7, And the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great number of priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Next slide, please. Stephen, it says, was full of faith and power and did great wonders. What should...
spark the mind of the careful reader is that Luke is now introducing a person that's not an apostle, suddenly filled with power and working miracles. And so that should kind of prick the mind. Uh, he's the very first one mentioned in the early church to do a miracle that was not an apostle. He's the very first one. He is one of the seven. The apostles appointed him. They laid hands on him. And they prayed for him. And after Stephen, we'll talk about Philip, and we're going to see some similarities, and we're going to see that, that Luke is following a very orderly, organized methodology to explain to us the movement of the early church. And I've said it a few times now in each sermon, hopefully, that the, the purpose of, of these studies is to get us back to looking at the church that God designed. You know, when you get far off the track... The best thing to do is go back to the beginning instead of your origins. You know, it's like the, the parallel line thing, you know, where they say if, if two lines that look almost parallel, but they're not really parallel, and you, you just spread them just a tiny bit, and, and you travel out far enough, the further you go, the further they get apart. Well, the best way to deal with that is not necessarily the travel from here all the way to here. Sometimes it's going back to where the paths split and to reevaluate and to get back on the way again. There's great value in learning about God's church, how it was founded, how it was structured, how it ordered itself, how it was uh, moving. And the way we do that is through the book of Acts. So here's this Stephen, a table waiter, but apparently more than a table waiter. The Bible says over and over again in just a few short verses that he's filled with the Spirit. And we know that if he's filled with the Spirit, that he must have uh, received the Holy Spirit. Okay? Just sounds simple, but it isn't that simple for some people. You know, the Spirit is an interesting thing because Jesus taught them and told them that unless you receive the Holy Spirit, that, that you, you, you were none of him. He taught his disciples in John chapter mm, 14, verse 17, that he, he taught them intimately. He said, you know, guys, the Spirit is with you, but he shall be in you. He made a distinction of having the Spirit with them versus in them. In another place, in John chapter, uh, I believe it's John 7, 39, he says about the living waters, how that when you come to the well that, and you have the Holy Spirit, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then it says, but this, and it might be John 9, 39, 7, 39, somewhere in there. He says, but out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Holy Spirit, which was not yet given because he was not yet glorified. He makes a distinction. He says that, that the Spirit is in him. It hasn't been poured out on the church yet because he hasn't been glorified. When he gets glorified and he raises from the dead, and then he does what he promises, he promises that he's going to pour out the Spirit on the church. And on the day of Pentecost, because all those Jewish holidays have prophetic uh, intonations, it has prophetic uh, messages for us to glean. And so God didn't just randomly throw out a bunch of holidays out there in their Jewish history. They each tell a story for the time they lived in, as well as prophetically, they tell of the times of the Messiah in the church. And so on the day of Pentecost, which was a harvest holiday, God pours out his spirit on the, on the church and the church receives the spirit of Christ in them. And it's through that spirit that miracles are done. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that miracles happen. Okay? And so we're going to talk a little bit about that and, and, and we're going to learn something here from, from this this guy who waits tables. 
Next slide. All right. We're going to ask a question. Who performed miracles in the Gospels? Okay. The Gospels are the first four books. They're where Jesus lived. That's the story. It's not the story of the church. The story of the church begins in Acts. The church did not exist in the Gospels. A lot of people don't understand that. The New Testament did not begin at Matthew. We put it that way in our book. We say this is the New Testament starts at Matthew. The New Testament, which means New Covenant, didn't start until the giving of the Holy Spirit. The New Covenant is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. The Gospel is simply the story of that life, death, burial, and resurrection. But the actual implementation of a covenant has to happen at the death of the testator. If I leave you, leave you a will and testament, it is not in effect until my death. And in the case of Christ, it becomes in effect, but he also raises from the dead. Okay, so that's amazing. And that comes from Hebrews. This isn't just Jeff up here spewing out thoughts of his own. Hebrews tells us that the new covenant does not come into effect until the death of the testator, which is Christ. Okay, and so the church, the new covenant, the new covenant church doesn't come to birth until Acts chapter 2. Okay? If you're talking about things in the gospel, you say, well, well, what about the thief on the cross? How was he saved? Well, he wasn't saved under the new covenant. When you bring me all your arguments about why you don't have to be baptized, they usually come from the gospels. Because when we look at the example of the new covenant, we find in Acts that everybody that gets into the church is baptized. You go, well, what about Romans 10, 9, where it says, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you are saved. How about Romans 6, 4? How about reading the whole letter? We were therefore buried with him through baptism. All the letters of the church include this language of death, burial, and resurrection. There's no salvation without the complete package, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Stephen is one who came through Acts chapter 2. He's repented of his sins. He's been baptized and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And in addition to that, he's been picked out, selected by the crowd of the church to be a leader, to be a servant, to be a deacon in the Greek, diakonos. And is not only selected by the people, he's appointed by the apostles. And they lay hands on him along with the other six. And they pray for him. I imagine for the gift to be able to do what's ahead for him, which is apparently a lot more than just waiting tables. So who performed miracles in the, in the Gospels? Well, Jesus did. The 12 did. He empowered them. And the 72 did. Outside of that, there were some prophets. Uh, Anna was a prophet. At the temple, at the birth of Jesus, Simeon. The Bible says flat out, John the Baptist was not. He didn't do any miracles. In John 10, 41, it says, Many resorted unto him and said, John did not do any miracles. But everything John said about Jesus has come true. Elizabeth was a type of prophet because she saw Mary when she came and said, Wow, you're the mother of my Lord. Uh, in a way, Mary performed a miracle by giving birth to a baby that had no father on earth. But that was not in her power. She didn't perform that miracle. It was done unto her. Joseph had a perfect, prophetic dream. And even, even the high priest, Caiaphas, uh, fell under the spirit of prophecy in John chapter 11, verse 50 and 52. When they're dealing with what to do with Jesus, Lazarus has just been risen from the dead and they're wondering what are we going to do with this Jesus guy in John 11 50 and 52 it says you do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than for the whole nation to perish this is the high priest he did not say this of his own accord but being high priest that year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not only for the nation but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad 
Wow, how interesting that the very guy who was primarily responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus actually prophesied that Jesus would do what he did. He came under that spirit of prophecy. But when we think about miracles, you know, like the blind seeing or the lame walking or anything else besides prophecy, the only miracles we see in the Gospels are done by Jesus, are done by the 12, and are done by the 72. And the 72, they're not operating in their own strength. The 12 are not operating in their own strength. They are doing miracles in the name of Jesus. There is one exception. One verse, one exception. It's in Luke chapter 9, verse 49. And the disciples come to Jesus and they say, Master, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told them, stop it. Because they weren't one of us. So here's somebody outside these circles doing a miracle. They're not prophesying. They're actually casting demons out. What does that mean? That means whatever ailment, whatever possession, whatever thing that had them controlled, they laid hands on those people and they said in the name of Jesus, come out, and that person was set free. That's miraculous as far as I'm concerned. And that's not prophetic. That's miraculous. And they said, stop it! Because they weren't one of us. And Jesus said, nah, don't stop them. Whoever's not against us is with us. Interesting. Interesting passage. A couple things to be interested by is not only the fact that they were outside the circles, but that they did their miracle, it specifically says, in the name of Jesus. So even though they were outside the circle, they were still operating under the same authority. The thing that happened was under Jesus' authority. It happened because they operated in Jesus' authority. Okay. You might wonder why I'm going here. I'm building. <laughs> now let's go to the church. Who performed miracles, next slide, in the early church? Well, Jesus did. The twelve did. And now we have Stephen doing miracles. That's interesting. And, 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 and we need to think like this. Well, eventually we're going to see Philip does. We're going to see some of that. Uh, we're going to be hearing about Philip's daughters. Anybody know what they did? Prophesy. Oh, and we might hear about this guy named Agabus that tells about some things. Prophesies. And we might hear about this Paul guy and how he fits in. And how about John's disciples that he meets? And what about Cornelius? And what about the Corinthian church? What about the Roman church? Do we hear about any miracles from the Roman church? Anybody? The answer is no. Okay. And I want to get to that in a couple months from now. I did the charts to show you a couple things. Sometimes people go to the Bible and they think there's no order or rhyme or reason to it and there's just miracles all over the place. No, there's not miracles all over the place. And if you start mapping out the Bible into the years that it has from the time of Genesis to the end, we read a lot, a lot of miracles. But if you really put in the time elements, you're going to see that there aren't as many miracles as you'd like there to be. When, when a person like Samuel comes on the scene in the Old Testament, it says these were the times when, when men had kind of forgotten the word and the presence of the miraculous wasn't really going on. For generations, kind of a silence, a void, a, a, a stripping down of the miracle. So I, 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 I think from a cursory read of the Bible, we begin to think it's just filled with miracles. And, and we just might even ask the question, why aren't we seeing the same kind of miracles today? 
and we miss something because there are lots of periods in the Bible where miracles are there and there are lots of periods in the Bible when they're not. It's just we're kind of going at it from a condensed view. So these circles are going to help us a little bit, hopefully. Jesus told us in John 14, 12, you shall do greater things than these. And I explained to you already that the church is already by this point doing greater things than Jesus because they've got a following of tens of thousands of people and they're with him. Jesus had people like uh, Tom Moran told us, or, or, or maybe, no, it was Richard this morning in Bible study. He, he said Jesus had a following where he fed miraculously a bunch of people, bread in John chapter 6. And, and, and by the middle or the end of John chapter 6, they're leaving him. They're leaving him. They, they, they were there for the miracles. They were there for the bread. But they weren't there for the bread of life. A lot of people want the benefits of Christianity, but they don't really want Christ. They want the benefits of a Christian life, but they don't really want the truth. When you love the truth, a lot of things change. When you love the truth, you change. When you don't love the truth, well, you take a parking spot and you fight for your lies. Where do your beliefs find their basis? Why do you believe what you believe? Some people believe what they believe because that's what their teachers told them what to believe. They believe it because they were raised that way. They believe it because mom and dad showed them that way. They believe it because that's the environment they were in. They believe it because that's their teachers and that's what they believe. Other people believe what they believe because of their experiences. I believe this because I've tried it and I've done it and I've felt it and this is what I believe because of my experiences. So you got people that believe what they believe because of their teachers, and you got believe people that believe what they believe because of their experiences, but there's another category of believers. And they are people that believe what they believe because God said it. And sometimes their teachers are wrong. And sometimes their experiences are even contrary. And so there comes a confusing moment in life in which you have to select, because I think we're all kind of a combination of all three. We believe in our beliefs because of the Word of God as Christians, and we believe in what we believe because of our experiences, and we believe in what we believe because we trust the people who taught us. And so we're a, a, a swath of all these three things. But every once in a while, our teachers conflict something that the Word teaches or, and I think this one's more challenging, our experiences yes. conflict something that the Word does or doesn't teach. What do you do with that? What do you do? Which one gets to have the preeminence? I mean, how hard would it have been for Christ in the wilderness to sit and look down at a stone and, and see it flash before him as if it might be bread? How, 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 how difficult might it have been to, to be a person that is unlocked spiritually for a moment and see the dark forces at work and then have to make a choice? Am I going to go with what I see? Is your faith by your sight? Or does your faith come through the Word? And so it's very important that we build our faith on the Word. 
So these guys arise from a, a synagogue, which it's called the Synagogue of the Libertines. It's the next side. And the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and the Cilicia and of Asia disputing with Stephen. And verse 10, it says, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. They were not able to resist him. Why? Because Stephen was so bright, because Stephen was so, so well schooled, because Stephen was special. No, he couldn't be resisted because he was operating. He was flowing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. He was speaking words that couldn't be shot down because he spoke through the power of the Holy Spirit. And they couldn't resist him. And it's irritating them. It's like I said earlier, some people are comforted by the word. Some people are directed by the word. Some people find peace in the word. Some people's hearts are warmed up by the word. But there are some people, when they hear the word of God, all it does is burn them. And at this point, Stephen's words are burning in the ears of these foreign Jews, if you will. These are Jews from the different cultures. Next slide. They're from all these places, and, and they're here now. And in Jerusalem, archaeologists have discovered many synagogues in Jerusalem. Because this is how they dealt with division in the, in the Jewish body. If you were from another culture, they recognized that sometimes linguistically or culturally or even kind of a, a morph of race, that you were different. And so they would have different assemblies for their synagogues so that they could meet in different places in Jerusalem when the holidays would come. Or if they moved there. And so they would have the Russian church down the street, and they'd have the Korean church down the street, and they'd have the Baptist church and the Methodist church and the Presbyterian church, and all the things that, defend, that, 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 that divided them so that they could be one body, sort of, but have all these splinters and splits to accommodate their cultural differences. Sound familiar? I mean, <laughs> sounds like our backyard. They're the Jewish people of the diaspora and they're irritated with Stephen. Why are they mad at Stephen? Well, first off, they're probably mad at Stephen because where do you think the widows came from? Where did these widows come from that are now in the church? Well, they came from these synagogues. How would you feel if some cultic group came in and took all our widows? And everybody that was uh, weak or, or, or needy or anybody that was on the, on the edges of the acorn assembly was suddenly gathered up and hauled off into a new cultic movement called Christian. Boy, you would, you'd be steaming. So the first assault that Stephen is dealing with is the fact that he's a cult leader. We don't care whether you... Wait tables or not, Stephen. You took the weakest element of our congregation, of our synagogue, and you brought them into your false doctrine thing called Christianity. And at this point, it's not even called Christian. They're still calling themselves Jews. They're just saying, hey, we're Jews that believe in the Messiah, and the Messiah is Jesus Christ. He's died. He's risen from the dead, and you should experience him too because he promises the, his spirit for you if you come to him and repent and are baptized, and you'll be filled with the spirit. And they're like, wow, you've brainwashed our women. You've divided, you're, you're, you're divisive. So that, that right there, you can probably put your two and two and three and three to uh, uh, build that when you begin to understand what it means to be Hellenistic, when you understand what it means to be part of the diaspora of Jews and, and, and the difficulty that's going on right here and what the church is up against. That right off the bat, it's very likely that that the women that are being served in the church are the very women that used to attend some of these synagogues that are set up in Jerusalem for women like them. They didn't come to Jerusalem saved. They got saved when they were there. Probably at the day of Pentecost or one of the holidays. Everybody's new in their faith. But they try to argue with somebody that's kind of low in the chain, the, the table waiter. And the, tub, the table waiter is out doing them. Which is interesting. Next slide. Same verse. Just wanted to come back to it. When the Holy Spirit fell, God gave them the ability to speak in tongues. 
What that means is, it's defined right in the text, that they suddenly could speak in languages that were of the diaspora. They, as apostles, could suddenly speak in the languages of the scattered Jews. It lists them. Several of the languages listed are the very same languages listed for the synagogues that we just read that are persecuting and angry at Stephen. And so the, the apostles are gifted with the ability to speak in Cyrenian or Alexandrian, which is part of Africa. And they are speaking in these languages and they are preaching the gospel. And people are floored and they're miraculously going. They're drawn to the miracle. It's like a moth to the light in the dark. It, they're drawn to it. And they come and they get saved. And it's amazing. And the Bible says that Stephen's doing other miracles. It doesn't tell us what. I mean, he may be laying hands on people and casting out demons or, or, or healing people. We're going to see more miracles. But he's... He's operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, and, and, and it's, it's luring. It's, it's mesmerizing to those with open eyes and open ears. But if your eyes and ears are already closed, all it is is hogwash. All it is is a circus and a magic show. And all you want to do is shut it down. Paul later deals with this whole subject of tongues when he gets to Corinth in his letter and he's mad because they abuse it. He says you, you, you use it when there's no one there to even understand it. You speak Serenian when there's no Serenians in the audience. You misuse it. He spells it out carefully in the whole chapter and he talks about how it's getting misused. A miracle in the church of Corinth is not being used for what it was given. It was given for the evangelization, evangelization of the nations. It says if somebody comes in there and doesn't understand what you're saying, will he not declare that you are absurd, that you're out of your mind, that you're crazy? He's so frustrated in that chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that he goes ahead and reaches deep into the Old Testament prophecies. And he grabs Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 11 and he says about the gift through men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners I will speak to this people but even then they will not listen to me. Paul's angry in his letter to the Corinthians. And he lets them know you've abused the gift. And the prophet Isaiah told us so long ago you would. That even with the gift, you won't listen to me. And these are them. These are an example of people like that that are coming at Stephen. They're not listening. Their ears are not open. They're not receptive. It doesn't matter if the gospels preach to them in their own tongue. And so they secretly persuade, verse 11, Then they instigate men which said, We have heard them speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man never ceases to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the Torah. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs uh, that Moses delivered to us. So the false accusations come. They, they create a four-part false accusation. I'm just setting up for next week. The four parts are this. Stephen, you don't teach Moses right. Stephen, you speak against God. Stephen, you speak against the holy place, the temple. And Stephen, you speak against the Torah. And so they bring these four 
accusations, and the Bible makes it clear they're false accusations, and they base it upon statements like that in verse 14. We heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Is that true? Actually, yeah. Yeah, Jesus did destroy that place. He destroyed it. It's gone. The customs of Moses delivered to us are not in effect. With the death of the testator comes the new covenant and there is no Old Testament. There's no Old Covenant to follow. You know, I see nowadays a lot of Christians trying to bring the two covenants together and kind of wash them and make this new covenant. The old one's gone, guys. It's scrapped. It's outdated. According to the Bible, it's done. It's of no effect. It has no effect on your life. Now, of all people, you should know I love studying the Old Covenant because it is rich in prophecy. It is rich in the heart of God. It is rich in displaying to me God's grace that has been eternal. It's not like God woke up one day and said, I'm going to be graceful now. It's not like he's this split personality, bipolar dude that's psycho that said one day I'm going to be mean and the next day I'm going to be happy. No, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And the covenant he had with the Old Testament people is just as rich and beautiful and loving and tremendous as the covenant he has today. And so I love the Old Covenant. I learn more about God, honestly, than I learn in the New Testament. I go to that Old Covenant and I, I, I'm floored with the beauty of my Creator and His love and His mercy. You think there's no mercy in the Old Testament? It's because you have not read it. There are more scriptures about mercy in the Old Covenant than there are in the New. There's more scriptures about grace in the Old Covenant than there are in the New. And there's hardly anything in the New that you can't find in the Old. So yeah, it's outdated. It's not in effect. But that doesn't mean you dishonor it. Doesn't mean that it has no value. So they bring false witnesses. They want to tear him down. They want to get into his skin because they feel as if he's destroying their covenant. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 11 and 12, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. How's that? How do you like that? Blessed are you when people bring false accusations because of me. Great is your reward in heaven. It doesn't feel good to be lied about. It doesn't feel good to be accused of things that aren't true or, or maybe they're just a play off of truth. They're just a portion of truth. But Jesus warned you that it would be like that. He said in Luke chapter 12, verse 11, Now when they bring you to the synagogues and the magistrates and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you will answer or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in the very hour what to say and how to say it. The very things that are happening to Stephen, Jesus prophesied and he said there's going to come a day when the people of the leadership of the synagogues and the Sanhedrin are going to come to you and they're going to take you and they're going to make false accusations to get you. I don't want you to worry about it. I want you to tap into the Holy Spirit at that point and let the Spirit speak through you. And that's exactly what Stephen does. And that's what the story is about. It's Luke showing us that the very words that Jesus spoke came true right here. Here's an example. Speaking in the Holy Spirit is not just the speaking in the gifted tongue. It is speaking the words in any language that he wants you to speak in the time you speak them. Those words have the power of life and death to those who heed them and certainly the power of death to those who do not. Today it's falsely taught often that to speak in the Holy Spirit is to speak in tongues. That's just not biblical. Were they speaking in the Holy Spirit when they spoke in tongues? Absolutely. Were they speaking in the Spirit when they were not speaking in tongues? Absolutely. To speak in the Spirit has nothing to do with what language you speak. 
It has to do with whether the Holy Spirit is operating through you and you're delivering the message of the oracles of the Almighty. Whether or not at the end of what you just said, you could say, Thus saith the Lord or not. And what that means for those of you who want to know, if you're able to speak in Hebrew, it's not important. <laughs> oh, That's exactly what I said. <laughs> if they had really loved the law, the Torah, if they'd really loved Moses, if they had really loved God, and if they had really loved the temple, they would have recognized Christ when he came. They were defending their own dogma, not God's. Theirs was not an indignant indignant zeal for righteousness, but it was a desire to protect their own self-interests. If they loved the Lord in truth, their understanding would have opened. When you love the truth, your understanding will open. When you don't love the truth, when you're set in your ways, when you're set on your teachers and you're set in your experiences, then you don't love the truth and the word cannot minister to you. You can't hear the word because you are camping out in the traditions or the experiences of man. You're in the temporal. You're in the things that are going to waste away. You're parking on a grain of sand when there's a whole beach. But when you love the truth, you change. They're angry. Last verse, 15. Thank you for your patience. In likeness of your patience, we'll treat you to lunch downstairs. <laughs> Everyone who sat in the Sanhedrin, they listened to the accusations, and we're going to listen to the sermon next week. He's going to bust it according to the accusations. Pe people don't realize it. They, they brought four accusations against him. And we go, wow, that's a long sermon that St Stephen gives. Well, he's busting out the four accusations. And, and it's cool to see. But they look at him. They fix their gaze on him. They're angry. I know they're angry because they're going to drag him out of the city. They're going to drag him out of the high court. Drag him out of the city. And they're going to pick up stones and they're going to crush his skull. So they fix their gaze on him. <laughs> and this is, this is amazing to me. And they saw. They. They. They saw his face. As if it was an angel. You'd think if you saw the face of an angel in somebody's expressions, in his demeanor, in his body, in, in his vibrant, if you, if you felt the power of the Holy Spirit in that level, you would think you would humble yourself. I would go, man, can you explain this to me? Because I'm just not getting it. You would at least be humble enough to say, I've been taught the traditions, I've had these experiences, and I'm under this old covenant, but the way you teach makes it sound as if I'm not it anymore, and I feel like you're tearing down the tradition of the elders, but the reality is I understand because of the, the power on your face alone that you must be doing something else. Let me hear what you have to say. But they don't even want to hear it. The Bible says in about 50 more verses, they are going to stop their ears. And the emotions in them are so hard, they're grinding their teeth. They're going to clamp down on their jaw, stop their ears, and charge that devil. We're going to get him. The answer of their accusation was already written on his face. They would have done well to stop there. But he's going to give his sermon against their four-part accusation. And his words would eventually sting them so much that they are forced to stop their ears and rush in on him and drag him out of the city and stone him outside the walls.
The word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword. Killing the messenger does not stop the truth. You think they would have learned that when they crucified our Lord? Killing the messenger does not stop the truth. Stephen will make it clear that the accusations are not correct in his reply, but he does not do that to protect his own reputation. He's not up there defending himself, but rather to promote the truth. A matter of fact, his words will not redeem him from the court of the Sanhedrin, but it will actually cause them to get more fanatic anger and enough to stir them to kill him. Wow, how quick we are to try to defend ourselves. They bring their four accusations against Stephen, and it's not about defending himself. It's about defending the truth. And then when it's done, the people with closed ears, their ears remain closed, and they murder Stephen. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the example you've set for us. Help us to see your truth and receive it. Help us to go back to origins. Help us to rebuild. We've been taught many things. We've experienced many things. And Father, we need to go back to origins. We need to start from the beginning again and come out so that we can get our parallel lines parallel with the way, the truth, and the life. For no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. And Lord, help us to do that as a church, as a family, as a body. Help us to go back to the beginnings and to be obedient to your word and to put our faith in the place where it should have prim primary preeminence. Right there in your word, God. Help us to repent. Help us not to be the ones that stop our ears or grind our teeth at your truth. And I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.